We all know Intel for its x86 laptop, desktop and server CPUs, but did you know that in the early 2000s Intel also made these low power ARM chips for smartphones and they were good, so good in fact that they very nearly powered the first iPhone. Now I've long been fascinated by these chips, so not only do you have one of them here, but I've also got some interesting devices. And most importantly, I've been in touch with one of the higher-ups of Intel's now defunct ARM division. There's a lot to cover here, so let's get started. But how did Intel get into ARM in the first place? Well, for that we need to go back to the mid-90s, where Intel had found itself in a legal battle with DEC, the Digital Equipment Corporation, which by then was a struggling computer and chip maker, best known for their VAX line of computer systems, and for the DAC Alpha CPU. DEC claimed that Intel had violated some of DEC's patents in the design of Pentium processors. Well, unfortunately for DEC, Intel didn't take too kindly to that, and countersued DEC in response. DEC was in a good position back then, and in 1997 an out-of-court settlement was reached, with Intel buying DEC's semiconductor manufacturing operations, which included Strongarm. Now, Strongarm itself is also very interesting, as it was a collaboration between ARM and DEC to create higher performance ARM CPUs than were available at the time. And using the expertise and the design methodologies DEC already had from their DEC Alpha CPUs, they were able to create the SA110, which for the time was an absolutely blazingly fast chip, offering way higher performance at a lower power than basically any other chip on the market. And that found itself into seminal devices like the Apple Newton. Now, as I stated at the start, Intel was and still is an x86 behemoth, and suddenly they found themselves with heavy and quite competent footing into the low power ARM world, which was totally different than what they were used to. Intel sold high performance x86 chips for many hundreds of dollars, whereas the cheapest strong arm sold for as little as $27. Now, what to do with that? Well, Intel had a plan as they wanted to target the new emerging internet-ready devices. PDAs were the precursors of smartphones. And for those devices, they just didn't have the chips available. But now with Strongarm, they did. While it was reported that Intel had to rebuild most of the Strongarm team, they continued Strongarm operations and expanding it with models like the SA1100 and the SA1110. Which brings us to this. Now this is an HTC Wallaby, but it's probably better known as the O2 XDA. And this is quite an important device in the transition from PDAs to smartphones, as when it was launched in 2002, it was one of the first devices to combine a big color touchscreen with cellular connectivity. And if you've ever heard of XDA developers, well, this is the device they got their name from, as it was an incredibly popular device to write custom software for. Now I only mention this because it is powered by an Intel SA1110. But by the time this device came out, Intel's ARM effort had already kicked into high gear, as they had rebranded Strongarm into Xscale. At IDF 2000 they revealed the new Xscale core, based on the ARM5 TE architecture, which incorporated Intel technologies built onto the Strongarm foundation, and using the 180 nanometer process technology. The new Xscale processor is the latest Intel, well, attempt from Intel to make our PDAs more powerful, taking over the strong arm line in the US. Joining us now with a few Xscale equipped PDAs, Tech TV analyst Han Choi. Welcome back, Han. Thank you. Now, I was really intrigued into this strange arm division, as it seemed almost like an alien group of people within the x86 Intel world. So, to find out more, I got in touch with one of the higher-ups of Intel's X-Scale division to find out a little more about it. Firstly, I wanted to know just how these ARM efforts were regarded within Intel at the time. And he responded, A lot of innovation in high-performance low-power came out of the small X-Scale team. The low-power approach was all-encompassing, spanning microarchitecture, physical design and software. Given Intel's fabrication prowess, the X-Scale team developed fabrication techniques as well. But Xscale was never the priority for the production fabs. 
When faced with allocation, Xscale was always behind x86. Second thing I wanted to know just how competitive these ARM chips from Intel were. Xscale in the handheld or battery operated market was way ahead of any competition. The CPU delivered gigahertz and milliwatts in a world of megahertz and watts. The scaling of a single SoC from low power, low performance to high performance, higher power was unrivaled. Furthermore, the team benefited from fabrication processes, which allowed very high integration of all components required for the cell phone market. And in my research about Xscale, that really became apparent, that ability to scale, and it's probably why it's also named Xscale. And a key aspect in that was the dynamic voltage scaling. In other words, a core's ability to alter its frequency and voltage from a low to a higher level, in this case ranging from 50 MHz all the way to over 1 GHz, and adapting its voltage accordingly to the frequency. And Intel continued Xscale development at quite a pace, launching the second generation Xscale core Bulverde in 2004. And the Bulverde PXA270 got a big frequency boost thanks to the 130 nanometer process node. And the GPU was also improved with Intel dubbing it Xbox in a phone. While that was a bit optimistic, the PXA270 powered incredibly innovative devices like this HTC Universal, which pioneered 3G on Windows Mobile and had a front-facing camera. And it also landed Intel big customers like Palm and later Blackberry. From all of this it does seem that Xscale was just about set up for success as it made a lot of things going for it. They had well-performing chips, they had the expertise, the manufacturing capability and the chips generally went into products people wanted. And in the mid-2000s a potential new customer approached Intel, Apple. And in 2013, the then-CEO Paul Mottolini revealed that Apple had approached Intel as they were looking for a chip to power a then-still-unreleased device they were working on, the iPhone. And Ottolini revealed he then made one of the biggest errors of his career. We ended up not winning it or passing on it, depending on how you want to view it, and the world would have been a lot different if we'd done it. The thing you have to remember is that this was before the iPhone was introduced, and no one knew what the iPhone would do. At the end of the day, there was a chip they were interested in, that they wanted to pay a certain price for, and not a nickel more. And that price was below our forecasted cost. I couldn't see it. But ever since reading that article, I wanted clarification. Would this chip have been an X kill? And he replied, Yes, it was. I do not know the details to elaborate. Intel business model didn't allow for the cost slash volume predicted for the early days of iPhone. So there we have the confirmation. The iPhone very nearly was Intel X scale powered. That would have been quite something. But after losing the iPhone, things were about to get even worse for X scale. As in 2005, Ottolini promised to bring Windows Vista to mobile devices using new x86 chips, based on both the Netburst and Pentium M architecture, using less than half a watt of power. And with that announcement, he basically pulled the rug from X scale, implying that low power x86 would be Intel's way forward in that segment. And those chips would become Intel Atom. And interestingly, if you remember the video I did on Intel's Tejas and Jayhawk, their failed netburst on steroids replacement for the Pentium 4, well, after that project was cancelled, many of the people on that project were tasked to work on Bonnell, the architecture that would power Atom. And indeed, a year later, the X-scale tale would come to an end, with Intel selling the entire division to Marvel for $600 million, paving the way for low-power x86 in mobile devices, or so they said. And my contact explained that this move was actually terrible for Intel in more than one way. The team was devastated. They felt like Intel threw the baby with the bathwater. All the innovation was given away. With the transition of the team to Marvel, Intel lost significant know-how and was never able to adapt the innovation to the x86 architecture, Reason? They gave away the x engineers. Fundamentally, there was nothing inherent about the ARM architecture that enabled the low power and high performance. It required the right thinking and the right execution. The move showed lack of imagination by Intel decision makers. They could have transitioned the x engineers intact to work on an x86 SoC for mobile, but chose a different path. And the path they continued on for smartphones was Atom, and they tried many times over the years to make it work, but it was never a success and eventually cancelled as well. And now we have a bit more insight as to why that was. 
as they basically gave away all the knowledge they had built up over the years with Xskill on how to make good low power chips. And it's just such a massively wasted opportunity. Which finally brings us to this. Now this is an Intel CE2110, which is a media processor powered by a 1 GHz Xscale ARM CPU. And it was launched in 2007, a year after Intel sold Xscale to Marvel, making it as far as I can tell the very last Intel chip from their strange foray into the ARM world. It was initially a very strange circumstance for Intel to get into ARM. Both StrongArm and Xscale turned out to be great chips with even greater potential, which came very close to powering probably one of the most important devices of the 21st century. However, ultimately they were let down by poor management decisions. However, it's not all bad, as my contact put it. Xscale was a very small team compared to all other Intel teams, delivering incredible products which fundamentally changed the world and ushered in a new era of high-performance, low-power handheld devices, opening the door for the now ubiquitous iPhone and Android devices. And on that high note, that's going to wrap up this otherwise rather bleak story. And I do thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and why not subscribe to the Fully Buffered channel. Well, that was all for now and bye bye.